Hello, uh, my name is Pavel. I'm principal engineer at CODB, and today we are going to talk about I/O scheduling in Scylla. Actually, not only in Scylla, uh, all the low-level magic happens in the library called Histar, so we'll talk about both. Uh, so here's an overview list of what had happened in the I/O area so far, and that had recently been released with 5.0. Uh, the largest thing so far is what we call uh, mixed mode handling. Uh, this is in fact a long story about how disks work, how they handle mixed workloads, and finally what can be done about it. Some shorter, uh, but still very interesting stuff includes more metrics on monitoring dashboards, uh, support for full duplex disks, uh, the long tempting ability to limit the disk bandwidth for the compaction subsystem, and some uh, short patch uh, that improved things a lot. Uh, so let's move on to mixed mode handling. Uh, the story started when we noticed that disks, uh, we checked SSDs, but HDDs uh, work similarly as far as I can tell. So disks didn't treat read requests and write requests equally. Uh, I mean, not at write request modify the contents of the memory cells and read requests don't. Uh, no, the thing is that uh, when you do pure read I/O and double the concurrency of disk requests, uh, the disk won't make any preference of one request over another. Uh, and the same for writes. Uh, there can be some internal scheduling, of course, but by and large, uh, all requests of the same direction are all equal to the disk firmware. Uh, however, when disk needs to do reads and writes at the same time, it won't treat reads and writes equally. Uh, here is the plot showing how it will. Uh, the rightmost bar is the maximum read and write bandwidth uh, a disk can do. Uh, next bar, it's called pure, uh, is the same, uh, but for the concurrency of one. Uh, since uh, disks have internal parallelism, uh, no wonder the pure bandwidth is lower than the peak one, so that's okay. Uh, the next bar, uh, continuous, uh, is uh, where disk unfairness reveals itself. Uh, if doing reads and writes uh, with the concurrency of one uh, at the same time, uh, disk will cle clearly inhibit read throughput uh, for some reason. Uh, as we later noticed, this inhibition is decreasing if the intensity of write decreases. Uh, and four left bars are mixed workload uh, with rate limited writes. Uh, and as you can see, uh, disk still pushes reads down, uh, even though not up to the same extent. Uh, this observation made us perform a profound measurement of disks. Uh, what we did was, uh, we took uh, the Linux disk tester application called FIO uh, and made it load the disk with a different rate-limited mixed workload. In fact, uh, we loaded the disk uh, with all kinds of mixed workloads. Uh, the test was uh, ran for all combinations of read rates and write rates in the bounds between zero and maximum possible uh, pure rate. Uh, we were interested in the read request latency, uh, and this is what we got. Uh, the plot has the write bandwidth on its x-axis, uh, read IOPS on its y-axis, uh, and in the area there is color-coded read request latency. Uh, the bluish area is the latency below one millisecond, uh, the purplish uh, the latency above one millisecond. Uh, oh, and the disk here is the SSD disk from the uh, AWS i3 instance. Uh, upper plot is mean latency, lower plot is P95. Uh, it's clear that this disk doesn't service mixed workload uh, well enough. Uh, reads can stay under one millisecond only if the total load on the disk is much less than its expected half, half duplex maximum. And this picture, uh, it looks pretty much the same for many other disks uh, that we've checked. Uh, here is the AWS i3 EM disk. Uh, well, of course, this one is notably better, uh, but still not as good as we'd like it to be. Uh, one can squeeze from it more than the half in each direction, but still uh, it's far from being a full duplex disk. 
Uh, again, here is the IM4GN instance. Uh, this disk is, is even better, but still, uh, full speed mixed workload uh, will cost us extra delays uh, above one millisecond. Uh, the greatest disk so far seem to be uh, the one from brand new i4i instance uh, from AWS. Uh, this disk is almost full duplex. Uh, actually, from Scylla's perspective, it's just full duplex. Uh, because Scylla almost never generates the mixed workload in the upper right corner with extreme write and read uh, rates. Uh, it likely stays in the blue area uh, above the half duplex diagonal. Uh, by the way, I mentioned that HDDs were not much better in this sense. Uh, indeed, this is how it works. Uh, HDD is also half duplex, uh, and worse, it cannot stand high write throughput, uh, and the bluish color is no longer one millisecond latency, it is uh, 100 times larger than that, mind the scale uh, on the right. So, uh, after all those measurements, uh, oh, uh, I forgot to mention that uh, the tool to do all these checks uh, and draw these nice plots is called Disk Explorer, uh, and it's available in the company GitHub repo. Uh, so, uh, after all the measurements, uh, the way to tackle disks uh, within one millisecond latency seem to be in queuing I.O. requests in, in software, uh, so that the rate of requests sent into the disk stays in the sub-millisecond area, or in other words, uh, or in other plots, uh, below this green diagonal line. Uh, the math equation that means below the green diagonal line is on the slide. Uh, it's not immediately obvious why it describes the above plots, uh, and the explanation is that Disk Explorer actually collects four-dimensional array of latencies, and shown on the plots are two-dimensional flat slices of it. Uh, and the equation on top describes the whole array, uh, not the individual slice. Uh, it looks complex, uh, but below uh, it's the same equation in, in simplified form. Uh, this simplification was needed because uh, the above equation uh, contains uh, some speed values, uh, and there is no way to measure the instant value of uh, anything like that, bytes per second or requests per second. Uh, in its simpler form, the equation allows uh, applying an algorithm called token bucket uh, to the flow of requests and making the equation stay true. Uh, like this. Uh, requests, the green bars, uh, get into a bucket at random timestamps. Uh, tokens, yellow circles, uh, get into a bucket with a fixed rate of 1, literally 1, uh, as uh, on the right part of the equation. In order to get served into disk, the request needs to grab some tokens from the bucket. Specifically, this tricky value in the brackets on the left side of the equation. Uh, this value is a fraction, yes. Uh, it can be thought of uh, as if requests were carrying pieces of tokens. Uh, in the end, the outgoing flow of requests will be rate limited perfectly according to the equation. Uh, this is what we have, and this is what we call uh, rate limited scheduling. Uh, so, as I told, it's in 5.0. Uh, good news is that it's backwards compatible. Uh, with uh, older Scylla's in the sense that you don't have to reconfigure Scylla uh, anyhow to make it work. Uh, it will just grab the legacy IO properties file uh, and will schedule requests. Uh, for fine-tuning of the algorithm, there is a new parameter in this file called rate factor. Uh, it can be used to better approximate the safety area for the specific disk. Uh, along with the new scheduler, uh, with the new scheduler itself, I mean, uh, there is also a pair of new metrics called consumption. Uh, these metrics show how many tokens were consumed by each priority class. Uh, by default, we didn't put them on dashboards, uh, and uh, if you want, you can look at them. Uh, they are practically useful for debugging purposes and just fun to look at. 
Uh, so, speaking about metrics, uh, the new Scylla has more than just those two fancy consumption counters. For everyday monitoring, scheduler exposes few more. Uh, for example, the length of queues, both the software one and in-disk one, uh, there are also two types of latencies, the software one and in-disk one. Uh, actually, the software latency metrics was there even before 5.0, uh, but uh, it was some random sample value picked from an arbitrary request, uh, and it was very flaky. Uh, short spikes could be missed from the dashboard, or sometimes quite opposite. Uh, random short spikes could dominate for some time, giving an impression of terribly overbloated queue. Uh, the new metrics uh, are more sane in this sense. Uh, and the last but not least, uh, the bandwidth and IOPS plots are now reported uh, separately for reads and writes, uh, which is practically useful for compaction and streaming priority classes. Uh, but let's get back to the uh, to these diagrams uh, colored for a while. That's the i4i profile, clean and nice. Uh, when I showed it for the first time, I mentioned that the, this disk is almost full duplex, and in fact, that's not the only example of such a disk. Uh, there can be several other options how to make uh, or, or buy uh, a disk uh, that have fully separated read and write flows. Uh, like this one. Uh, Please note that we do not recommend this setup for Silly, especially if you want to squeeze as much performance as you can from it, uh, but still. Uh, one of the ways to get highly available data at the cost of terrible latency uh, is to build replicated storage where data is copied over the network somewhere in the highly available storage. Uh, and in case of i4i disk, uh, as I mentioned, of course, uh, so, scheduler in this case would better not make reads and writes uh, be accounted into the same uh, token bucket. Uh, it better schedules them separately. Uh, and 5.0 scheduler has this ability, uh, some under the hood details. The IO scheduler abstraction in CSTAR is two level and has uh, the IO queue itself and the fair queue component that's responsible for doing. Uh, cross-class balancing and uh, that thing uh, with tokens. Uh, nowadays there is a configuration option uh, in the IO properties YAML file that can be used to uh, actually split IOQ's internal fair queue into two uh, and make IOQ send reads and writes into different directions. Uh, thus they will be accounted and scheduled uh, individually and separately. Uh, we call this mode uh, full duplex scheduling. And since we are already in the IOQ internals, uh, here are some more details. Uh, above the IOQ, there is a set of per class queues uh, for compaction, for queries, for commit log, uh, and so on. Uh, this is what makes scheduler a scheduler, uh, so that high priority query disk requests are not drawn uh, in the flood of background compaction requests. Uh, now you know that a new IO scheduler rate limits the outgoing flow of requests with the help of token bucket uh, that's configured according to the disk abilities. And the very same token bucket is now also on the per class level uh, with more uh, classical configuration. Uh, now one can limit the bandwidth each class may consume. Uh, in megabytes per second. Uh, in particular, there is an explicit option in Scylla to keep disk uh, bandwidth usage by compaction activity strictly below a certain threshold, even if the disk would otherwise be idling. Uh, and the last uh, but not least, uh, in 5.0 scheduler we have uh, fixed the request preemption. Uh, in simple words, uh, IO classes uh, do not always have requests to be served in their queue. Uh, sometimes classes can get drained uh, or may choose to send one request at a time, thinking after each request completion before submitting a new one. Uh, in either case, class is not always present in the scheduling queue. Uh, 
so when it leaves it for a while and comes back a bit later, uh, the scheduler has to balance between two inefficiencies. Uh, on one hand, uh, e e well, first is to compensate the lack of disk access uh, by the class and give it an increased I.O. budget. Uh, this would uh, keep classes fair uh, between each other, uh, but will make other classes suffer for some time from high latencies because uh, disk will have to effectively be monopolized by the newcomer. Uh, another option is to continue treating the new class as if it never had any disk access and just make it compete with other class from scratch. Uh, in this case, low priority class can uh, deliberately or by chance uh, generate a priority inversion like problem and may start consuming more disk bandwidth than it should actually do according to its shares. Uh, it's not the problem that's specific to IO scheduler. Uh, it's generic for all uh, scheduler for, of, a, of a specific type or class. Uh, and we actually spent some time researching and improving this uh, thing specifically for IO scheduler in 5.0 and the result was truly amazing. Uh, here are two plots collected while stress testing the 5.0 Scylla server with and without a fix. Uh, the latencies on the left side, uh, which is without a fix, uh, not just look worse. If looking at the y-axis values it's seen, uh, that they in fact dropped from second scale to tens of milliseconds. Uh, and I think it's really cool. Uh, so this is it. Uh, thank you for coming and listening. Uh, 